Hello, this is Brother Gomez here at Cambria Baptist Fellowship in Newcastle, Wyoming. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, the topic of our study is entitled The Diligent Seeker tonight. And it's, uh, it speaks of one who loves seeking God. <laughs> Amen. You know, I think uh, I had a a vision last night and the Lord had me up since about three o'clock this morning with it and uh, and uh, it was uh, it was a rather profound vision and I'm sure as the Lord um, shows me how to articulate it I'll put it together and share it um, as the Lord allows me um, but it, it spoke to me of diligence and seeking him while he can yet be found See, because when different kingdoms rose and fell and there were there were pagan kings and there were God-fearing kings, you know, um, I would imagine when those dark times of the pagan rulers were around, it was kind of hard for believers to find God just anywhere they went. It wasn't as accessible, so to say, or popular. And... You can see that kind of happening now in increments around the world. It's been happening in third world countries throughout history, you know, but here in America, we're starting to feel the ripple effect of that. And that's a very uneasy feeling, you know, but praise God, our trust is in him, amen. Our peace is in him and our, our um, comforter is him. <laughs> so praise God for that. But nevertheless, we don't, disregard the facts of the spiritual atmosphere that's being created by the world okay um, but in a sense I guess more allowed by God due to spiritual principle okay if I could say it that way I, I believe that's a little more correct um, so anyway um, I, I went in and this morning the Lord told me go and look up the word diligent and it um, comes from the Latin root word diligre or diligere and diligere's definition is to value highly or to take delight in okay is the root of the word diligence and it has proven that we're more diligent about what we love to do okay scientifically it's proven we're more diligent about what we love doing right and that makes common sense right um, and so um, the word seek is simply um, an attempt or desire to obtain or achieve something. Or archaic is to go back to a place or ask for something from someone or search for and find someone or something. Okay, so to diligently seek here, you're, you're, you're making an effort to something that you value very highly, something that you love to do, okay, and you seek for it. You know, you're looking for it. You're trying to obtain it. And so um, here, when, when the Lord said to, to seek him diligently, if we break it down that way, he's talking about a relationship, first of all, between the believer and his creator, God Almighty. And it speaks of, of the diligence or, or the love for the word of God, the love for the presence of God in the believer that begins to go deeper and begins to go beyond the, the, the surface of things when it comes to their faith. And, and we begin to dig deeper into the root of what God is really calling us to do and how he's created us to become in him. Because it's in the becoming, a new creation. It's not, it's not in the works that we do, but it's in the works that he's accomplished through the cross and through the preaching of the gospel to bring us into the revelation of not only who Christ is, but who we are to the Father in Christ as his people. So in Hebrews, there's, it speaks of the rewards for diligence. And it says, Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, speaking of God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There's a reward. And that reward is eternal life. That, that reward is a peace that passes all understanding. That reward is the fruits of the Spirit of God. 
the treasures of heaven, the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom. You know, the other day I was explaining about building treasures in heaven, and God had shown me that it is when you build, because Jesus, when they asked him, show us the kingdom of heaven, he said, surely the kingdom of heaven is within you. So he made it a personal thing, okay? And, and uh, the Lord had told me, he said, when you build key, um, treasures in heaven that cannot be destroyed, cannot be, you know, rusted away, or the canker worm or the, or the moth can't come in and destroy it, it's when you're building my eternal spiritual principle within people's lives. The, the things that God treasures, the things that money can't buy. Faith, peace, joy, trusting in God, intimacy with God, learning what it is to be a child of God. This is building treasures in heaven. So when I am a part of God doing that through the gospel in other people's lives, and they're a part of doing that in my life, then we in turn are building treasures in heaven spiritually here on the earth. And we can see the evidence of the kingdom that is upon us or amongst us. Because we build it on kingdom principle. Through the preaching of the gospel. Isn't that amazing? The things that the word of God can do in a person's life. <laughs> you know, when mingled with the spirit of truth... And the love of God, it just, it, it's just miraculous. It really is. I've seen so many lives that people had counted out for the count, turned around, a complete 180. You know, they didn't do the 360, <laughs> you know, just run, just do this and, you know, keep going in the same direction. They literally, they repented and turned around and went completely in the direction that God was telling them to go. And that, to me, is the biggest miracle you'll ever see on the planet because it's the only one that causes all of the hosts of heaven to rejoice. It's precious. So here, we're going to continue in um, speaks of um, diligence in studying God's word, 2 Timothy 2, 15-19. <clears throat> It says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Approved to who? To God. Man's not always going to approve you. Jesus showed us that. He, he showed that very clear. The word made flesh, never sinned, and they still crucified him because they, they thought he was cursed and that he had a devil. And that he was a blasphemer. That, that just... That, that always blows my mind. <laughs> as much as they saw and as much love as he showed, and they still hung him on a cross. But in a sense, it doesn't because God had a perfect plan with it. And he knew that's why he was sent. So he confessed that nobody took his life from him, but he freely gave it. Things aren't always the way that we see them in our carnal way of thinking of humanity. And so here it says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Boy, what a, what a statement. Be diligent <laughs> to present yourself approved to God. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> you know? Hey, wait a minute. Somebody, you know, fill me in on something here. <laughs> How is that possible? Only by being one who was led of the Spirit of God. Because there was a lot of people that were very scholarly in the Word of God. And they were the ones crying, crucify him. Along with the rest of the crowd. So it's not enough to be a hearer, but we must also be doers of the Word of God. And so here it says, a worker... Who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. It's interesting that it says they will increase to more ungodliness. It compares babbling and profane language or profane or, or false doctrine as ungodly. 
in its origin, in its root. That says, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus, Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, <laughs> I love that word in the Bible, <laughs> in a lot of places. It says, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Amen. It says, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity or from sin. That's a profound statement also. The whole Bible is a profound statement <laughs> in my eyes, you know, and in my heart. But this, this here, we've been talking about... Um, you know, sanctification, we've been talking about dying to, to the flesh and coming alive unto God, dying to our sin and, sin and coming alive unto God. And here again, it says that everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Walk away from sin. Deny the devil. And he flees from you, right? You resist him, he flees. A lot of the problems that we have come from that principle. We don't resist Satan enough sometimes. And so we become comfortable with the works of iniquity. We've all done it. For all have sinned and fallen short or come short of the glory of God. But he who has died to sin and come alive unto God is to learn how to not allow sin to rule and reign in our mortal bodies. He's not talking about when immortality comes so much as right now. And then, of course, but right now, we have a choice. And the Bible tells us about it in many different places. This is one of them. And so we as believers, in our diligent seeking of God, we find that he takes us from glory to glory to glory to glory with him. So we, we elevate as we follow and we seek diligently the way of the Lord. And we begin to kind of, in a sense, spiritually speaking, we can look back and go, whoa. I can't even, at some point, you look far in the back and I can't even see myself who I used to be. I'm a completely different person now. And I'm still learning every day. I still got to pick up that cross every day. I still got to go forward. But guess what? I'm not, I'm not that guy no more. But you know what? Most people will keep you right there if you let them because that's where they like to stay. You ever hear that old worldly cliche, misery loves company? <laughs> you know, miserable people, they don't like to see when God changes your life if they're not allowing God to change their life because then they got to deal with the reality that they haven't made the change that they knew they could have made the whole time. And the, proof, the proof is in the pudding, so to say. They can't deny the good works that you do that our Father in Heaven be glorified. And once you do them, they're done. You know, you continue in them and they continue to be done. So as we diligently seek Him, there's different rewards like I said um, earlier about in Hebrews, that he rewards those who diligently seek him. The rewards are, are those very things. Not having to live in sin. Not having to have a contentious spirit. Not having to hold on to your past sin and allowing the, the love of God and the blood of Christ and the teaching of the gospel to bring you from that place of that glory that was fading away forever to come into the eternal glory of the Father that is found in Christ Jesus that never fades away and continually through all eternity brings you closer and deeper in your walk with God throughout all eternity. You will always be walking deeper and deeper and deeper with God in the love of God in the peace of God, in the joy of the Spirit, 
and the overflowing of the Holy Ghost. I couldn't imagine how it's going to be when we go to the other side of the veil of eternity and we hear the testimonies. When we can sit literally at the feet of Jesus Christ and we can hear the apostles tell of their experiences and things that weren't even written and tell of the things that, that they said that Christ did that if, it were, if they could imagine if they were written in books that the depths of the sea and the heights of the heaven couldn't have, couldn't have contained them all. <laughs> you know, wow. How amazing is that? You know, that's, that blows my mind. <laughs> you know, it really does. It makes me think, goodness, we can barely comprehend <laughs> the vastness of, of the Gospels. Much less all that awaits us. And so here, it bears saying again, 2 Timothy 2, 15, the end of verse, or 2, 19, the second half of the verse, says, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's why we need each other, people, because it's not always easy to do, especially if you feel isolated or you feel like you don't have someone you can talk to, somebody that will pray with you. You know who your friends are when, when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know what, I ran into this one guy, and he said he knew you, and you know what, he spoke really good of you. You know? I've heard that a couple times in my life, and it blessed my heart. And I was like, wow, I didn't really, I didn't even know that guy thought that of me, <laughs> you know? And there's been a few times that people have asked me about other people, you know, and, and they were kind of maybe kind of not the nicest thing to say. And, and I said, well, actually, that person, you know, I don't know if you should believe what you heard, man, because that person known for a while was pretty good people, you know? And, and it's good to, to speak the truth in love, you know? It, it really is. It, it's, it's a healer, you know? It'll change the atmosphere. Absolutely. It'll change the atmosphere. And so um, as we walk away from that iniquity, like I was saying, we go from glory to glory to glory with God. And he takes us there by grace and by mercy and by love and by just nurturing us, you know, and cultivating his word within our hearts and in, in our minds because we've sought him. There's a place, is it Ecclesiastes? or I think it may be Ecclesiastes. Anyway, um, forgive me if I don't quote the right book, but um, I was reading that where it said, there was a part in the scripture where it said that God would be with those who, who pursue him or, or seek him out, but that those who forsake him, he will forsake them. Isn't that interesting? Because we always hear that, you know, Jesus told his disciples, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But that was based upon the principle that they sought him, that they had a relationship with him. A lot of people say, well, I don't believe in God. If there is a God, he, you know, he, he don't want nothing to do with me. <laughs> well, maybe it's because they didn't want nothing to do with him. And he's not going to push himself on anybody. He'll reveal himself to you. <laughs> Unannounced sometimes. There's a part of scripture where the Bible says, where I've, you know, I've um, revealed myself basically to those that did not seek me. Or did not come after me, you know. He is re referring to Romans, I think, 21 or 10 or something. 10, 21 or something. You're talking about where Paul was talking about the people that were stiff-necked and they just rebelled all the time. And finally he said, lo, I go. I, I go to the Gentiles. <laughs> you know. So we got to understand the content of not just the Old Testament and what was said in the Old Testament, but how it all, all foreshadows things in the New Testament. And that all foreshadows things in the testimony of our lives. It's an ongoing thing. It's a consistent principle because God is consistent. He doesn't change. And so anyway, um, we're going to go on to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 14. And this speaks of diligence and how it produces holy conduct and godliness. And it says in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. 
both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. So here it's telling us that in diligence, again, <laughs> to be diligent, to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless before God. Because we're not preparing for the end of the world. We're preparing for the next step in eternity. So we have great faith towards God. We have great confidence towards God because we diligently seek him and find him. And we can find that peace that passes understanding even if all the elements of creation are melting away. <laughs> That's pretty intense when you think about it. I remember when Mount St. Helens blew up in 1980. I was a kid <laughs> and, and I was in my home state. And I tell you what, people thought it was the end of the world because it looked like it. <laughs> I mean, it was weird. <laughs> there was... There was um, these cotton ball clouds, perfectly spaced and the perfect same size lined up, perfectly spaced apart this way and this way, as far as the eye could see in the sky on a clear day. It, it looked bizarre. And then all of a sudden it got dark and ash started falling. And people were freaking out. But you know what most of the kids were doing? Their eyes were getting big. And I think most of us were thinking, man, this is like snow. <laughs> I think some of the kids were thinking, man, can we sled this stuff? What's going on? You know? And I thought about that. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, that's kind of how we got a we gotta view when if if we ever live to see a day like that come. We need to be like them children, trusting God and saying, oh, boy, this is going to be cool. It might not be, you know, like when you go on a, to an amusement park as a kid and you see that big old um, roller coaster, <laughs> you know, and you see people getting off it and they're going, whoa, you know, you're about to get on that thing. You know, you're like, man. That looks scary, but boy, this is going to be a blast. Watch this, you know. And what do you do? You get on. <laughs> and you hold on tight and you go. <laughs> and at the end of the ride, you get off and you go, man, can we do that again? <laughs> you know? And that's how a child is. And that's how we are as children. Now that I'm older, I'm going to go on roller coasters. <laughs> Especially if I eat something. <laughs> you know? Might lose my lunch. But nevertheless, um, I use that analogy because here, that's what it's explaining. It's saying um, that we should be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Not only blameless by others, but not carrying around some kind of guilty, false humility. Be set free by the truth. Be set free from your sin and your shame. Walk in the newness of life through diligence. Diligence takes work, which means it's not going to always just be comfortable and easy. But diligence is diligence. If you keep pressing in and pressing on, next thing you know, you're going to advance. You're going to make some, some headway. Whether you're building a house or you're building a ministry or you're building a sandcastle or, you know, building blocks or whatever. D 
diligence is, is uh, a powerful tool. It takes faith and it takes vision. You got to have a vision. You know, when you, when you first start, you know, courting your wife, you kind of have this idea and all of a sudden it starts to get clearer and your vision starts to, you start to see the future, so to say. <laughs> start to time travel in your thoughts and, oh man, you know, she's, she's, everything's going to taste perfect. All the food's going to be cooked perfect. The, the, the clothes is always going to be ironed in my and she's never, ever, ever going to get mad at me for nothing. She just, man, it's just going to be so nice. And then the work comes. <laughs> the honeymoon's over, and she's like, man, boy, do you got to leave your shoes out there every time. You know? <laughs> you, know what I, you know what I'm saying. But diligence, next thing you know, diligence will teach you the adjustments you need to make in life is the point that I'm getting at. Okay? Um, It'll take you out of the, the, your head out of the clouds, so to say, or the fantasy or the delusion <laughs> and bring you into the reality. And then you make the choice to continue with that vision and to put forth the effort and the work that it takes to make it happen. And do it fervently. You know, do it. You can do it. You put your mind to it. And you can get it done. And it takes one another in the body of Christ. It really does. It takes a heart to serve. You never appreciate the work that goes into something until you're a part of getting it done. Some people, they frown on marriage or ministry or, you know, whatever. But until they work it out and make one work, they go, wow, there's great value in that. It's a lot of investment. And, you know, life's not always fair. Don't get me wrong. There's some people that are really dedicated to their marriage and they don't work out. It takes teamwork. The good thing with the covenant between us and God is that Jesus Christ never fails, never falls short. <laughs> Praise God. He's never going to betray the, the purpose. He's already shown that at the cross. He's finished his work. He said it is finished. It's a finished work of Messiah that we become a part of through diligence. And therefore we can do like it said in 2 Timothy let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. So if we're going to continue here in Jeremiah 29, 13. We seek God with our hearts and not just our minds. And Jeremiah in 29, 13 says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. See, so. You know the song that goes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. Well, here, I believe is part of one of the scriptures of why they write songs like that. Because it says, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. Your heart has to be in this, people. Not just your mind, not just your tradition, not just your family heritage, but your personal heart, your heart. See, my family heritage predominantly is a different type of faith. As you know, a lot of Mexicans are into Catholicism. Well, I'm a Christian. I'm a proud Christian. I'm proud of my Jesus. <laughs> I love him. 
And you know, that's caused me to be, I, 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 maybe I'm boasting you, my family, whoever's watching, you call me and tell me, but uh, my Christian walk has caused me to be one of the most lovable people in my family. Because God told me to love people unconditionally. We all know that some families have issues. Serious issues. And some not so serious issues that they allow to become serious issues. <laughs> you know? But in Christ, we're not to conduct ourselves that way. Even if they do. We're to love. We're to forgive. We're to humble ourselves. And even if they ever slam the door on us or, or hurt our feelings or hold a grudge or whatever, and they come to your door, you open that door, if they're hungry, you feed them. If they're cold, you give them a jacket. You know the story. If they're thirsty, you give them some water. Once in a while, you pray for them. You love them. You treat them as if they had never wronged you. Because that's going to minister more. Hopefully it's going to cause them to think about your relationship with Jesus Christ and how it might work for them to, if they don't have one with you. And so it's a heart, it's a heart issue here. It, it's really neat to me how the scriptures, it's always so personal, you know, it's so applicable to our person. Not just to convict us, but to encourage us. Not to shame us, but to warn us against the things that are out there and the things that are within that need to be laid to rest. And teach us how to pick up that cross and how to follow the way of Jesus Christ. See, I'm looking forward to the day where we can stand before Almighty God and Jesus himself is going to confess us to the Father. He's going to speak on our behalf to the Father. And it's not going to be who we were before we were Christians. It's going to be who we became when we truly died to our sin and came alive unto God and truly gave our life to God, truly became saved. We didn't just say it, we actually did it. We won't be counted amongst those who came and said, did we not prophesy in your name and feed the hungry and heal the sick in your name? And Jesus said, get away from me, you workers of iniquity. I've never known you. We're going to be amongst the ones that he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's, what I, that's, the, that's the goal in my life. Not just for me. Because if it's truly your goal, it's your goal for others. That's what's in the heart of God's, God's people. Salvation for the lost. It's not enough for you to come to church. You need to become the church. This is a building where the church meets. It's very important that we get this revelation. It should spark a fire in you. See, I'm very, very contained. Here, this is, this is the most contained place I've ever preached in my life. It really is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I go one of the people who go, hallelujah! Every time I'm talking, half the time they're going, hallelujah! <laughs> Praise the Lord! <laughs> Amen, brother, preach it! <laughs> you know? And then I'll have my, 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 my niece's daughter, my great niece, uh, every time I said amen or, or something, she'd go, amen. 
you know, and she was assured it. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, I remember I used to open services, a little Tylee would come stand next to me and hold my hand, and everything that I prayed at the opening prayer, she would repeat it. And at the end, I'd say, Amen, and she'd go, Amen, and she'd look at everybody like, All right, now, and she'd go and sit with her grandmother and do the rest of the service. <laughs> you know, little girl. <laughs> you know? Sweetest thing ever. And the Lord told me to make sure that she knows she's included. We don't want to exclude anybody from the opportunity to be a part of what God does amongst his people. It's important. From the least of us to the greatest. We need to treat them all the same. All of them. Rich, poor, young, old, doesn't matter. You need to treat them with the same diligence that you treat your own salvation in the Lord. That's the heart of the Lord. It's not always easy, but with God, all things are possible. <laughs> Amen. The key word, with God. <laughs> Amen. You got you to gotta have that walk with, with the Lord. I shared the other day, and a diligent man of God came and helped us put a sound system here so that we had a sound system here. Did a wonderful job. Did things that I could not do. For me to continue to more efficiently minister to the body of Christ, what a blessing. Not because he had to, but because it's in his heart, it was in his heart to do. And that's service to the Lord in a tangible way. It moves mountains. It moves mountains. First Chronicles 16.11 says, Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. We must seek his face. The Bible says when we see him as he is, we shall become like him. The word see there speaks of understanding. When we understand God and how he is and how Jesus is, we'll become more like him. Because we'll fall more in love with him. We'll admire his ways more. We will value them more. We'll become more diligent. I said early that, earlier that diligir, the, the, um, the root word in Latin for diligence means to value highly or to take delight in. So when we diligently seek and find him and seek his face, we will delight in him. We'll delight in doing our service to the Lord. We'll find delight in his commandments. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. At the beginning of the service today, I was talking about how when pagan kings ruled and when God-fearing kings ruled, the dynamic changed, the atmosphere changed, the accessibility to, to godly communication with others and stuff became kind of rare and far and few in between, if, it, if that. And we're seeing that happening to our society more and more as we go forward in our current situation, in our nation, they take God out of our government, out of our schools, they're trying to shut down um, sound doctrine. We're on the verge of becoming a hate crime for preaching the gospel. There may be a day they come in here and say, hey, if you say this or that, we're going to shut you down. That's when we need to be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And be at peace no matter what happens. And still be an example of the Christian faith. 
love unfeigned. The example of Christ when he was being crucified and he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The Bible says that there were others, um, by, bystanders, and they were saying, behold, he prays for you. Those who had nailed him to the tree. What a powerful statement. How will we stand when we're put to the fire? How will we, res will we respond when we're nailed to the cross that Christ told us to carry? When those closest to us give you up to the death to save their own hides, Are we ready? Are we good to go? This could very well be something that we see in America at some point. If we're around much longer, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. But you see, Jesus never responded in violence. He responded with mercy and salvation. Reminds me of the Book of the Martyrs by D.C. Talk. It's a book about modern-day martyrs that have died in the last century or so. It tells stories about young ladies and young men being burned at the stake for their Christian faith and singing praise to God, and, and that the people looked upon them, and it seemed as if the flames weren't even hurting them because they were just focused on their, on their worship of God. And it turned many non-believers into believers by seeing that testimony. So what the devil meant for evil, God caused it to turn around and work together for the good. Because God knew that at that point in time, there were some people there that were going to give their lives to Jesus through the testimony of that diligent one. <laughs> to the very end, remain faithful. It's a powerful way to, to view the Lord's strength in our time of need. We see a lot of things happen. But like I said earlier, our joy comes from the Lord. Our help comes from the Lord. Our comfort comes from the Lord. Our strength comes from the Lord. I want to end with this. If we seek God, we'll live, right? <laughs> we find God, we find our life with God. In the book of Amos, Five, chapter 5 verse 4 it says for thus says the Lord to the house of Israel seek me and live <laughs> amen not, not just live right now our daily life but live forever live eternally with God know God walk with God talk with God ask God for wisdom he'll give it to you abundantly he'll, he'll, he'll answer you the things that no one else can answer for you He'll strengthen you. He'll help you. He's a faithful God. I remember many years ago, and I've heard it through the years. I'm sure you guys have heard this too. If Jesus was ever going to turn his back on you, he would have done it on his way to that cross. But you know, he, he went through it all for you, for me, and for as many who will call upon his name. Let us pray. Father, I, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the teaching of your Holy Spirit, Almighty God. 
I thank you for the wisdom that is found, Lord, as we diligently seek you, Father. Let us find you in the quiet place of our heart. Let it quiet all the thoughts of our minds that can sometimes take us and distract us from what you are saying and what you are, you are doing, Lord. And let us find that peace that passes all understanding, Lord, as we diligently seek you with all of our heart, Father God. Help us, Lord, to be prepared, Lord, for every moment, every day that you still have before us, Lord. We know, Lord, that you're faithful. And we just ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.